All right, let's get started. This is Mr. Baxley, and I'm recording a video for the Como Picton Dual Credit History class and the Como Picton Honors class over the 1960s and 1970s in U.S. history. This lecture is going to include hopefully some stuff about the 60s and 70s along with the Vietnam War. So we're going to flip back and forth between two PowerPoints. So let's get started. Last week we talked about the 1950s and the era of American history that we talk about like the early Cold War. Well, as we move into the 60s and 70s, we move into what I like to think of as kind of the middle of the Cold War. And this is some of the most intense portions of the Cold War. But let's talk about politics real quick. In the year 1961, John F. Kennedy becomes the president of an optimistic and confident nation. The Cold War was a worrying challenge, but in the early 1960s, it was very clear that the United States had economic and military superiority, and the rest of the world looked to the United States for leadership. When John F. Kennedy became president, he challenged Americans to work hard to end poverty and injustice at home. And even after John F. Kennedy's tragic death, his vice president, Lyndon B. Johnson, work to complete his efforts in a massive social program called the Great Society. Over time, however, the controversies of what we'll talk about the Vietnam War and the domestic strife that happened during the late 1960s unravels the Johnson presidency. By the end of the 60s, by 1968, the confident, optimistic America had been bitterly divided along many lines. There were a series of assassinations in the year 1968 that led to rioting. And by the early 1970s, Americans were ready for something different. They were ready for a return to normalcy, and they were weary of social programs. So let's talk about the election of 1960. In the election of 1960, we see two men face off for the president. We have the Republican candidate and a former vice president, Richard Nixon. Richard Nixon was Dwight D. Eisenhower's vice president, and he ran against Democratic Senator John F. Kennedy. John F. Kennedy was the first Roman Catholic to run for president that was successful. He was the youngest candidate to ever run, and this election would be, no matter who won, would be the first time the president would be born in the 20th century. When they had this election, Richard Nixon emphasized his experience as the vice president and his commitment to fighting and defeating communism in the Cold War. John F. Kennedy stressed his character and his heroism during World War II. Both of these men were veterans, but John F. Kennedy had been a much more um, popular figure because he won the Medal of Honor for some actions that he did in the Navy. Both candidates were moderate on most issues. They weren't actually too far apart on the issues, but they were a little bit different in terms of their character and personality. John F. Kennedy was from a wealthy family. He was a Harvard graduate from Massachusetts. Richard Nixon was from California. He had grown up in a poor family and he had to work hard to get his way through college. And uh, he had come up from you know, poverty to higher and higher positions in government. And both of these men were ambitious and both of them wanted to be the president. Now, this election was so close that many historians think the deciding factor was the very first televised presidential debate. We talked about how TV changed a lot of ways that Americans spent their time, got their news, had entertainment. Well, television changes politics. Rick, uh, John F. Kennedy is often considered, in my opinion, to be the TV president because he really became president because of television. Whenever John F. Kennedy and Richard Nixon had their debate in 1960, in the election of 1960, Richard Nixon, he was a tough, manly man. Whenever the studio people came in to put makeup on him to make him look good for the camera, he didn't do it. He didn't want to. He was too tough and manly. John F. Kennedy, he wanted to look good, so he made sure that he looked good on camera. John F. Kennedy made sure that he wore colors that looked good on black and white television. And Richard Nixon had stayed up late the night before studying for the debate. He didn't get a whole lot of sleep. He looked tired. He had a cold. He kept on blowing his nose and, you know, looked real kind of sick. 
while John F. Kennedy looked real, you know, nice and clean and he had, you know, everything in order. He looked right at the camera and talked directly to the American people. And when people watched the debate, a lot of people thought John F. Kennedy had won. But the interesting thing is, if with people who listened to the debate on the radio, they thought Richard Nixon won. So it wasn't necessarily that John F. Kennedy had better ideas than Richard Nixon, it's that he looked better. And in many ways, image is so crucial to politics today. Politicians spend lots and lots of time today thinking about the way they look on a screen. And this really started with John F. Kennedy. And this is how close it was. Kennedy earned 49.7% of the vote. Richard Nixon won 49.6%. So that's less, that's a, about 100,000 votes difference. That's a very, very close election. And it's largely because of the debate that many people say that was the tipping point that let Kennedy win the presidency. When Kennedy became president, it was, you know, this dynamic young family, the Kennedys, that moved into the White House. And for many people, they captured their attention. You know, a lot of people thought of the Kennedys as like, you know, King Arthur and the Knights of the Round Table. They even called it Camelot. He was very photogenic. He had photogenic kids. Reporters loved him. They were charming. And John F. Kennedy had a lot of optimism that he brought to the presidency. Whenever he was inaugurated in his opening speech, he set forth challenges for the United States. He said, ask not what your country can do for you, but ask what you can do for your country. He said, don't ask what the government's going to do to help you. Think about what you can do to help the country. And so he tried to inspire Americans to help others. And his programs, what he called the New Frontier, urged talented Americans to work to end poverty and injustice. He wanted Americans to put forth effort to solve problems rather than for them to sit down and let the government solve their problems for them. Okay. John F. Kennedy signed legislation to raise the minimum wage and increase Social Security. He showed some support for the civil rights movement, but John F. Kennedy was working with a very conservative Congress, and a lot of his proposals were blocked. His ideas, though, went on after his death. He had a lot of ideas for increased protection of millions of acres of wilderness. He had ideas to increase funds for uh, public education. And he had plans for some way, some sort of thing like Medicare to provide health insurance for the elderly. All of those ideas were put into place by his vice president, Lyndon Johnson, after he died. John F. Kennedy is also known for being a candidate that, a president that encouraged Americans in the space race. And we talked about the space race a little bit last week with the 1950s. But in 1957, Sputnik was launched by the Soviet Union. And the Soviet Union showed that it was technologically ahead of the United States. They were able to put a satellite into space, and we had not. So after that, the United States created NASA and pushed for more and more science and mathematics education in the United States schools and colleges. Kennedy challenged the people of America to try to put a man on the moon. And you can watch a really good video of that speech where he made a speech in Houston at Rice University, a, a speech where he challenged Americans to go to the moon. He wanted the most talented young Americans to put everything they had into putting a man on the moon before the end of the decade to not only catch up with the Soviet Union, but to move beyond them. Now, the space race was in some ways a race for mankind to grow in our technology. You know, we wanted to have more development. We wanted to be a stronger, uh, more uh, technologically powerful country. But in many ways, it's also something for the whole world. Humanity breaking out of this earth and setting foot on a different body in the heavens, you know, to put a man on the moon the first time a human sets foot on something that ain't part of the, of the earth. But on the military side, if you can put a satellite into space, you can put a bomb into space. And if the Soviets have more satellites than we do, if the Soviets have better rockets than we do, then that means that they have a much better ability to shoot bombs at us, to shoot missiles at us, and that sort of thing. So we have to catch up for science and for our safety. So the United States puts our space program into full force, and by the end of the decade, we have several firsts. 
Al Alan Shepard become the first American in space. The Russians beat us to space. Uh, and John Glenn became the first American to orbit the Earth, but the Russians had did it first. But we were able to catch up and then overtake them. And by 1969, Neil Armstrong became the first human being, and he was an American, to set foot on the moon. John F. Kennedy continued the policy of containment in the Cold War, but he moved away from Dwight D. Eisenhower's mutually assured destruction, where we just blow everybody up and we threaten everyone with being blown up, to a more flexible response. Rather than solving every problem with threatening nuclear missiles, John F. Kennedy wanted a stronger traditional military as well as special forces. He also focused on humanitarian efforts like the Peace Corps, which was led by Sergeant Shriver, where Americans would volunteer for two-year terms to assist developing nations, keeping third world countries from becoming communist. Essentially, Americans would, could join the Peace Corps and go and volunteer in other countries and help them develop, help them develop their infrastructure, help them develop their education systems, things like that. And that would help us make friends. The United States needs friends in the Cold War. And one of the best ways to make friends is to go around and be friendly, not go around and shoot everybody, but go and help and so by going and helping other countries, the United States is able to build good relations with countries across the third world. The United States and Latin American relations had gone bad since World War II as kind of as a result of this. During the Cold War, early Cold War, we were very heavy handed. We did not want any countries to go communist and we were perfectly willing to use the military to do so. Kennedy created the Alliance for Progress to help the Western Hemisphere to develop and to fight communism. Now, we talked about the Berlin Wall before, but the Soviet Union had control over East Germany, and West Berlin, which was a capitalist democracy, was stuck inside the middle of East Germany. So many East Germans had escaped to freedom in West Berlin that in 1961, the Soviet Union built a wall around Berlin called the Berlin Wall. This Berlin Wall becomes a symbol for the Cold War, dividing a city in half like the world was divided in half. John F. Kennedy went and visited that wall in Berlin, and in, in, when he visited the city of West Berlin, he made a speech where he said, Ich bin ein Berliner, where he said, I'm from Berlin too. And he's basically telling the people of Berlin that your problems are our problems. We are not going to abandon you. The United States is gonna stand by Berlin. We are gonna contain the spread of communism. We are not going to allow communism to spread, not even to a tiny little city in East Germany. We're not going to do it. Now, it's a pretty big city, but we are not going to let one city fall to communism. And that was the point. Now, the scariest part of the Cold War, in my opinion, happens during John F. Kennedy's presidency. If you wanted to point one instance where we almost actually decided to blow each other up with nuclear weapons, it's the Cuban Missile Crisis. In 1961, the CIA trained Cuban exiles. Okay? They were people who had fled from Cuba when Cuba became a communist country in 1959. Remember from last week, we talked about this a little bit. In 1959, Fidel Castro led a communist revolution in Cuba. Cuba had been like our little brother country ever since the Spanish-American War. In 1898, we fought the Spanish-American War, Cuba got its independence, and the United States made Cuba a protectorate, where we protected them. We kind of told them what to do, but they were a close ally of the United States until 1959, when they had a communist revolution and they became our enemies. When the communists took over Cuba, a lot of bad things happened. A lot of people were killed and a lot of people ran away. These were exiles and they ran away and many of them ran away to places like Florida in the United States. That's part of why there's a large Cuban American population in the United States is there are a lot of people who left Cuba during the communist revolution and came to America. Now, the CIA, our Central Intelligence Agency, our spies, they had trained many of those Cuban exiles to be soldiers. And they helped them go back to Cuba and land at the Bay of Pigs, hoping to start a counter-revolution that would get rid of Fidel Castro and get rid of communism and bring Cuba back into the fold of the United States. This invasion was actually planned when Dwight D. Eisenhower was president, but it didn't actually happen until John F. Kennedy became president. 
So John F. Kennedy inherits this problem. And when the invasion happens, it fails miserably. And it embarrasses the United States and it embarrasses John F. Kennedy. But it scares Fidel Castro. Fidel Castro and the Soviet Union, who is backing the communist Cubans, they are terrified that the United States is going to invade Cuba and get rid of communism. So the Soviet Union secretly puts nuclear missiles in Cuba. And in October of 1962, the world almost blows up. The United States use spy planes that fly over Cuba, and they take pictures of what seems to be nuclear missiles in Cuba. Intelligence determines that these are Soviet Union missiles that are nuclear capable, and they are able to hit the United States, and not just Florida, but some of these missiles, it seems, are within range of Washington, D.C., okay? So, this is very scary. These are fast missiles. There's not a good way to shoot them down. This is not like an airplane carrying a nuclear weapon that we could shoot down before it got to us. This is a missile that when it gets launched, there's nothing we can do, okay? It's, you know, a city gets blown up. We can shoot back and blow up their cities, but there's no way for us to try to intercept it. So people are terrified. Many American generals advocate that the United States immediately invades Cuba. But if we invade Cuba, what if they shoot a missile at us? And what if that starts World War III? We start shooting missiles, the Soviet Union starts shooting missiles, and pretty soon we're all dead, okay? Kennedy tries to cover a middle path. Instead of attacking Cuba, he surrounds Cuba with warships. It's not a blockade, because that's an act of war. It's a quarantine. Isn't that funny? This is a quarantine of Cuba. Nothing comes in, nothing goes out. Okay? And John F. Kennedy orders the Soviet Union leader, Nikita Khrushchev, to turn his boats that are carrying missiles to Cuba back. The United States and the Soviet Union almost go to nuclear war. There's a great YouTube video. I have a link here. I don't know if y'all can click on it, but it's uh, the Cuban Missile Crisis in, I believe, seven minutes. You can look it up to explain some more. But the United States and the Soviet Union go back and forth in negotiations. And finally, the leader of the Soviet Union, Nikita Khrushchev, agrees to America's demands if the United States removes missiles from Turkey and Greece. If you look at a map, the relationship between the country of Turkey and the Soviet Union geographically is very similar to the United States and Cuba. The United States had missiles in Turkey that were pointed at the Soviet Union that were just as threatening to them as the missiles in Cuba that were pointed at the United States. So we both agree to get rid of our missiles. We get rid of our missiles out of Turkey and they get rid of their missiles out of Cuba and everyone breathes a sigh of relief. But if you wanted to pick a moment where the United States could have blown up, this is right here, the Cuban Missile Crisis. John F. Kennedy manages to negotiate the crisis without going to nuclear war. And this is a very, very big victory in his presidency. This is probably the most significant thing that he did because we did not all go to nuclear war and the missiles were removed. But almost, Within just a little bit more than a year later, John F. Kennedy is assassinated. John F. Kennedy is getting ready for re-election campaign in 1964, and he is trying to smooth out some feathers in the South. You see, John F. Kennedy was a Democrat, and the Democrats had typically had support in the South, but John F. Kennedy was pro-civil rights. That means that he was against segregation. And so Southern states that had segregation of African-Americans and white Americans, they did not like John F. Kennedy. So John F. Kennedy goes to Texas and he goes on a goodwill tour in Dallas, Texas on November 22nd, 1963. But it is during that tour, it's a nice day, he takes the top down, they're driving slowly through the middle of Dallas, that two shots ring out and John F. Kennedy is killed. Immediately, a manhunt goes out to find the assassin, and it is determined to be a man named Lee Harvey Oswald, who set up shop in the sixth floor of the Dallas Book Depository, and he had a perfect sniper's, sniper's uh, setup. They found the setup. They found him shortly thereafter, and they capture him. 
And when this happens, Americans are terrified. Think about just the moments, the first few hours after John F. Kennedy is killed. John F. Kennedy is rushed to the airport. He's clearly dead. There's no hope in getting him, you know, there's no resuscitation. He's shot in the head. He's dead. Lyndon Johnson becomes the president and America prepares for war. Think about it. Just a year before, John F. Kennedy embarrassed the Soviet Union by getting them to back off and take their missiles out of Cuba. Many Americans think, did the Russians do this? And many Russians are probably freaking out, thinking, do the Americans think that we did it? Because I don't think we did it. There's thoughts that maybe it was the mob. Maybe it was this person or this person. But America braces for war. We are entirely terrified. Once they find Lee Harvey Oswald, they get ready to figure out what happened. Why did he kill the president? What was his beef? What was he upset about? But before we can actually figure that out, another man, Jack Ruby, who's really mad at Lee Harvey Oswald for killing the president, goes up to Lee Harvey Oswald while he's being transferred from one prison to another. So he's being taken from one prison to another prison. Jack Ruby walks up and shoots Lee Harvey Oswald dead. And so no one really knows why Lee Harvey Oswald killed John F. Kennedy, because the person that did know was Lee Harvey Oswald and he's dead. And there's all kinds of conspiracy theories about John F. Kennedy, whether he was actually killed by Lee Harvey Oswald, whether there was maybe another shooter, maybe Lee Harvey Oswald was working for the mob. Maybe he was a disgruntled Southerner upset about civil rights. Maybe he was a communist. Who knows? There's conspiracies about Jack Ruby. There's conspiracy after conspiracy after conspiracy. But the point is we don't know. And that kind of bothers us. And, and so rather than talk about the conspiracy, I'd like to talk about conspiracy theories in general. This is something that you find in American history. We lose trust in our government during the 60s, and we stop believing everything they say. There is an investigation that goes, and it finds Lee Harvey Oswald acted alone, and he did it for his own personal motivations, that he was not part of some plot or something. The Congress just says that. But it doesn't satisfy people. Some people will say, okay, fine, that's it. But most people in America, at least as far as I can tell, and this may be me, my own self, just guessing, but a lot of people are unsatisfied with that explanation. And to this day, there are people that continue to doubt the government's explanation of John F. Kennedy's assassination. The government's explanation is very convenient. It was not the Soviets. There's no need for nuclear war. It was just some crazy guy. And that is nice for us. I mean, we didn't go to nuclear war over this, so we didn't all die. But many people are not satisfied with it. And there's a lot of things that happen in the 60s and 70s that break Americans' trust in the government. And to this day, we question and doubt things, okay? The sad reality is, is that sometimes bad things just happen. And there's bad things that happen that we can't explain. Humans have a knack for trying to find order in chaos. We don't like things to not make sense. Have you ever stared at a cloud that was just a cloud and saw a shape in it? Have you ever looked at you know, a ceiling tile or a piece of toast and saw a face? Okay, Humans love to look at random dots and connect the dots in their mind. Okay, John F. Kennedy was shot. Why? We try to connect the dots because we want it to make sense. Because making something make sense helps us feel more better than if it's just some random person dying. So, why was John F. Kennedy shot? I don't know. And you don't know either. And we'll probably never know in this life. But he was shot. And so rather than spending all of our time worrying about why he was shot, let's look at what happens as a result of his death. Lyndon Johnson becomes president. And for John F. Kennedy's programs, this turns out to make a lot of them successful. Lyndon Johnson becomes president. He's from Texas. He's a Democrat. And he has a lot of experience in the legislature. Okay? Lyndon Johnson had spent a lot of time in Congress, and he knew how it worked. He didn't just know, like, how Congress worked, like, you know, okay, you study the Constitution, you know the rules. Lyndon Johnson knew the people in Congress. 
bedrooms. He knew what their favorite lunch was. He knew who they were sleeping with. He knew what they did at dinner. He knew their bad habits. He knew their dirty secrets. He had dirt on people. He knew what they liked, what they didn't like, and he had a lot of favors ready to call in. Lyndon Johnson uses the opportunity of his presidency to set forth the biggest reform agenda since the New Deal. So if you look at the expansion of the federal government, the New Deal was the biggest one by far. But second place is the Great Society. The Great Society was Lyndon Johnson's plan to end poverty and end injustice. He wanted an America where there was no poverty and there was no injustice. And he had a lot of support in the wake of Kennedy's assassination. Johnson was really good at persuading people by saying, hey, this is what John F. Kennedy wanted, and he's dead. You want to vote against John F. Kennedy's bill? He's dead. You want to see his dead wa his wife? Okay, his wife's still alive, and she's sad because her husband is dead. You can make her feel better if you voted for this law. And he was very persuasive like that. Look at this picture right here. John F. Kennedy was a big dude, okay? And he loved to get physical, okay? He used his commanding presence his big hands, his fingers, he'd lean into people's face and he'd get them to do what he wanted to do, okay? John F. Kennedy would call up legislatures while they were eating dinner at home. And, you know, say you're a senator and you're about to eat dinner, your wife's made this nice meal, having a good time, and then the phone rings and they say, it's the president. Well, you can't say, hey, I'll call you back, Mr. President. You've got to answer, Okay. So you sit on the phone with the president, you talk about whatever he wants to talk about because he's the president. And he's not gonna let you off the phone until you say, okay, Mr. President, I will vote yes on this law, okay? He loved to do that. He had phones everywhere. He would call people. He knew how to get the wheels turning in Congress. And he got some of the biggest laws in American history passed in his presidency. For example, We'll talk about this later when we talk about civil rights, but Lyndon Johnson is the president to get the Civil Rights Act of 1964 passed, okay? Lyndon Johnson is the president who convinced enough people in Congress to pass a law that would ban discrimination based off of race and sex in public facilities and in schools. This is the reason why schools have black and white kids going together. This is why there is no black rooms in a restaurant and white rooms in a restaurant. This is the reason why white and black people get to ride on the bus together. The Civil Rights Act of 1964 is the law that does this. Lyndon Johnson got this done, and he did a lot of work persuading people to get it done, okay? Johnson also signed a law called the Economic Opportunity Act of 1964, where he declared a war on poverty, and there's all sorts of programs that are created to help stop and end poverty. He was an accomplished legislator and an effective persuader. He got a lot of laws passed. And some of the things that he did, a lot of these things were things that John F. Kennedy proposed, but John F. Kennedy couldn't get through Congress. Congress just fought him tooth and nail. Lyndon Johnson knew how to work Congress. Wilderness Protection Act saved 9.1 million acres of forest from development. Elementary and Secondary Education Act gave funding for public schools. The Voting Rights Act banned literacy tests and worked to protect African Americans' voting rights. Medicare gave health insurance for the elderly. The National Endowment for the Arts and Humanities funded artists and research. The Immigration Act, he ended those discriminatory, discriminatory quotas based off of ethnicity that we talked about in the 1920s, okay? All those National Origins Acts are overturned by Lyndon Johnson. Omnibus Housing Act provided funds to construct low-income housing, and the Air and Water Quality Acts worked to reduce pollution. So Lyndon Johnson was fairly successful in his first term as president, in just his first few years as president. And then he ran for re-election in 1964 and won. He becomes the president outright, which from 1965 to 1969. But in 1968, things turned sour. Lyndon Johnson gets all this stuff done in the home, in the domestic front, but Lyndon Johnson's presidency gets unraveled because of a tiny little country in Southeast Asia, Vietnam. So we're going to stop there, and we're going to pull over to this PowerPoint about the Vietnam War, okay? So, Vietnam War. Here's an overview. This is the longest war in American history. 
Technically, Americans are involved in Vietnam from around November 1st, 1955 to April 30th, 1975. But the official war is from 1964 to 1973. But over two decades of effort, billions and billions of dollars, and at a cost of nearly 60,000 American lives, the United States fights a war without consistent public support. At the beginning of the Vietnam War, the larger portion of the country supported the war. Only two senators voted against getting involved in Vietnam at the beginning. But over time, the public became disillusioned with the lack of an easy victory. This is a war fought against unconventional enemies fighting a guerrilla campaign, and there are nightly television news broadcasts going throughout the United States that bring the war into American living rooms. Over time, people began to feel as though the war was not worth the cost, and the U.S. abandoned South Vietnam, and it was overran in 1975 by communist forces. So, how did it all get started? The Vietnam War you've probably heard about, but where is Vietnam? It's in Southeast Asia, just south of China, very close to the Philippines. It's a, a region known as Indochina, okay? Now is Laos, Cambodia, and Vietnam. It had been a French colony since 1860, but after World War I, an independence movement was started by a man named Ho Chi Minh, who tried to get Vietnam its independence from France. This would seem like a good thing to the United States, but there was a problem. Ho Chi Minh was a communist. During World War II, Japan conquers Vietnam from the French. And Ho Chi Minh leads a resistance movement against the Japanese invaders using guerrilla warfare tactics. And we've talked about guerrilla warfare before. It's a defensive war where you're fighting on your home front and you're using the land and the terrain to hit, do hit and run attacks, ambushes. You're not trying to beat the enemy outright, but rather you're trying to wear them down. Kill a few of them here, kill a few of them there, kill a couple people at night in the ambush, lay a landmine, blow up a couple people on patrol, and you just keep bleeding the enemy dry. A few here, a few there, just cutting somebody up with a tiny little pin knife until they bleed out. That's the idea behind guerrilla warfare. His army becomes known as the Viet Minh, and Ho Chi Minh becomes a hero. Ho Chi Minh is kind of like the George Washington of Vietnam, if it, to make you think about it. You know how like we have George Washington on our dollars and on our quarters, our capital is named, you know, Washington, D.C. Ho Chi Minh's that guy for the Vietnam, Vietnamese, okay? He's, he's like on everything. There's a city now called Ho Chi Minh City. With the defeat of Japan at the end of World War II, Vietnam said, okay, well, we're independent now. But France says, no, you're not. You're our colony still. Just because Japan took us, got it rid of us, doesn't mean we're gone. So at the end of World War II, France goes back to Vietnam and they start a war where Vietnam tries to fight for their independence. Now, you would think that the United States would be okay with the country getting its independence from a colony. That's what happened to us. We were Britain's colony and then we fought for our independence. Why would we not support Vietnamese people having their independence from France? Well, the problem was Vietnam wanted to be communist, and we were not cool with that. So we need to talk about something called the domino theory. The United States believed that a communist victory in Vietnam would lead to a further spread of communism across Southeast Asia. If Vietnam falls to communism, then Laos will fall, then Cambodia, then Thailand, then Malaysia, then Singapore, then Indonesia, and pretty soon all of Southeast Asia will fall to communism. And remember, we want to contain communism. So to stop communism from spreading throughout the rest of the world, we've got to fight it in Vietnam. The idea is that if we fight communism in Vietnam, we won't have to fight communism in America. So. We help the French. When President Truman is president in 1945, we start supporting France in its fight against the communist rebels. We spend about $1 billion per year giving money, weapons, materials, and support to the French fighting against the Vietnamese. But the Viet Minh Army fights a fierce war and they wear the French down. They keep bleeding them dry in tiny little attacks over and over again. 
hiding in the jungle, striking out in the middle of the night, killing some French people, going back and hiding in the jungle. The French go chase them. Then they have a booby trap and they have an ambush and it just goes on and on and on for 10 years, for nine years. By 1954, the French are wore out. They've been fighting for nine years and they still do not have control of the country. The Vietnamese general Vo Win Gap defeats the French at a large battle, an actual real battle, you know, not just a guerrilla tactic, but by 1954, they're strong enough to have a full force battle, and they defeat the French at Dien Bien Phu on May 8, 1954. At that point, France says, you know what? They can have Vietnam. We'll go back to France and do our own French thing. You just, you can just have Vietnam. So France begins to withdraw. But when they withdraw, they decide to separate the territory of Vietnam into two zones, the northern and the southern zone. You see, during the rebellion, North Vietnam was the more strongly communist zone. South Vietnam was more loyal to France, and they had more capitalism. So when the French leave, they divide it into two zones at the 17th parallel, with North Vietnam being communist and South Vietnam being capitalist, and in a temporary arrangement until elections could be held. But the elections never happen. Those two zones become countries, and they are immediately gripped in war. The North Vietnamese start infiltrating South Vietnam, and they start outfitting rebels in South Vietnam who are called the Viet Cong. So the Viet Minh are the communists in North Vietnam. The Viet Cong are the communists in South Vietnam, and they are supported by the Viet Minh. Other communist countries like Russia and China start giving weapons and money and materials and later things like airplanes to North Vietnam and the Viet Cong in South Vietnam, okay? They are very clearly supported. These soldiers are carrying AK-47s. They're flying Russian MiGs in the air, okay? This is very clearly the communist countries of the Soviet Union and China are creating a proxy war where they're sending their materials into North Vietnam and the United States is sending our materials into South Vietnam. So we have a proxy war where a war is fought on behalf of two larger countries by two smaller countries. So the Vietnam War is the United States against Russia and China, but we're fighting in Vietnam. The United States backs up the South Vietnamese and their unpopular leader named No Dinh Diem. Diem was a corrupt leader, but he hated communism, so the United States backed him up. We give him money, weapons, and military advisors. Those are American soldiers that go and they train South Vietnamese soldiers to fight against the communists, and they even participate in combat. In November 1963, Diem is murdered in a CIA-backed coup. Okay. The United States gets tired of him, and we, we try to put someone else in power, but it doesn't really work. All the leaders of South Vietnam were ineffective compared to people like Ho Chi Minh. Ho Chi Minh was a communist, but he had the respect and admiration of the people. No Dinh Diem had the backing of the United States, and his people didn't really like him. And really, that was the problem in Vietnam the whole time. The United States had a hard time getting the people of Vietnam to be loyal to us, okay? The people of Vietnam were forced to choose between their home and communism, but it was their home, and the United States, a foreign country, and capitalism. And even though capitalism is a much better system than communism, and the capitalists out of Vietnam had a lot more prosperity, and a lot of benefits that North Vietnam did not have, many people in Vietnam were simply viewed the Americans as invaders. And they didn't, they didn't understand or they didn't think about all the geopolitics and the benefits of Marxism versus the benefits of capitalism and all that stuff. They just cared about their homes and they saw people being killed by soldiers and so they went to war to defend their homes. By the time Lyndon Johnson becomes president of the United States in 1963, South Vietnam is losing the war very badly and things are going very bad for South Vietnam. So the United States becomes increasingly invested in South Vietnam's war efforts and we start sailing our ships very close to Vietnam. 
And if you know something about American history, do not touch our boats, okay? Guess what North Vietnam does? On August 2nd, 1964, American Navy ships are sailing in the Gulf of Tonkin and North Vietnamese gunboats shoot at our ships. They don't really sink any of them, but they shoot at us. And that's all we need. That's the excuse we need. You touch our boats, you're gonna die. That's the American way, okay? Do not touch our boats. Think about it. Spanish-American War, what happened? 1898, they attacked, they blew up the USS Maine, or well, it blew up. But we blamed on Spain, we go to war. World War I, Germany starts sinking our boats with submarines, or boats with Americans on them with submarines. We go to war. World War II, Japan attacks Pearl Harbor. Don't touch our boats. We go to the War of 1812. The British start capturing American boats and forcing American sailors to join the British Navy. Okay? It is a clear pattern in American history that if you want to go to war with the United States, shoot our boats and see what happens. Okay? So, two days after the Gulf of Tonkin incident, Congress votes some, on something called the Gulf of Tonkin Resolution. The Gulf of Tonkin Resolution gave President Lyndon Johnson the authority to take all necessary measures to repel North Vietnamese aggression. Okay? Johnson sends U.S. troops into Vietnam. On February 1965, Operation Rolling Thunder begins as the United States conducts a sustained bombing campaign of North Vietnam in the Ho Chi Minh Trail. I'll show you the Ho, Ho Chi Minh Trail is this right here. The North Vietnamese would go around the border between South and North Vietnam, and they would go through technically neutral Laos and Cambodia and through a network of tunnels and secret, secret roads and things like that, they would bring supplies into South Vietnam for the communist Viet Cong there, okay? We start bombing the Ho Chi Minh Trail. We start bombing North Vietnam. And in Operation Rolling Thunder and throughout the Vietnam War, more bombs are used on North Vietnam than in the entirety of World War II. The number of explosives in World War II is less than what we dropped on North Vietnam. We also developed new weapons called Agent Orange, which is a herbicide, it kills plants. Vietnam is a jungly place, and we start spraying basically weed killer all over the whole country to try to get rid of the jungle where the Viet Cong and the Viet Minh would hide and strike out with guerrilla attacks. Agent Orange later led to a lot of health problems, for Vietnamese people and for American soldiers who are exposed to it. There's a lot of Vietnam veterans today that have really bad types of cancer and health, health problems that were caused by Agent Orange. A lot of American soldiers died years after the Vietnam War because of their exposure to it. I mean, don't do this, but basically it's like dumping Roundup all over your body and letting it sit there because American soldiers would get covered in Agent Orange. It would like like, have you ever seen a crop duster plane as it blows over, you know, a field and just releases, you know, pesticide and herbicide? Just imagine that, but you're under it, okay? And this is bad stuff. It also has led to a lot of really bad problems in Vietnam because that stuff got into the ground and in the water. And there are children today that are born in Vietnam with some of the most rare and awful birth defects because of Agent Orange. And it's pretty nasty. We also use things like napalm to start fires and other types of bombing to really force the Viet Cong to dig underground. By the end of the Vietnam War, the Viet Cong, the communists, had dug nearly 30,000 miles of tunnels under Vietnam to get around American bombings. As the war progresses, the U.S. General William Westmoreland leads American combat troops into South Vietnam beginning in March 1965. And American soldiers, honestly, are very successful in the Vietnam War. That's a misconception about the Vietnam War. On the ground, when it comes to battles, the U.S. Army was very effective. The problem was, is we didn't really have enough resources, and we never got the loyalty of the people. So we were really good at fighting the enemy, but we were not so good at getting the Vietnamese people to like us. There was a American soldier who said the way to win the war is with rice and knives. We need to give rice to people and make them like us. And if there's a bad guy, we need to kill him, but with a knife. So only the bad guy dies. But the way we fought the Vietnam War was with 
tanks and airplanes and helicopters and machine guns and flamethrowers and Agent Orange. And we killed a lot of bad guys, but every time we kill a Viet Cong soldier, we kill somebody's dad or somebody's grandpa or somebody's uncle or somebody's brother or somebody's son or somebody's husband or somebody's cousin or whatever. And every time you kill a Viet Cong soldier, you make somebody mad. And then you make somebody hate the United States. So as we escalate the war, we escalate the number of Vietnamese people that oppose us. American tactics are a lot of search and destroy missions. We search through the jungle. We look for evidence of communism. When we find it, we kill them. Okay, we go through a Viet Cong village. We go through a Vietnamese village. We search through one of the huts. We find some AK-47s in some hut. We burn the thing to the ground. We figure out who owns those AK-47s. We kill them. Okay, because the Viet Cong didn't wear military uniforms. They didn't have a shirt that said, I'm a member of the Viet Cong. A lot of times there might be a farmer, you know, working in a rice paddy and he would wave hi at the American soldiers and they'd wave hi at him back, maybe hand him a chocolate bar. And then that night he would be shooting at them in the jungle. Or you might have a Vietnamese, you know, a Vietnamese woman who's working in the American military base, washing clothes for American soldiers. And then she goes back home that night and she tells the people in her family that are part of the Viet Cong where to shoot their rockets and where to shoot their mortars and say, that hut, there's Americans sleeping in it. You need to throw a grenade there. Okay. The Viet Cong were very frustrating to fight because the enemy was hard to see. A lot of times they'd be hiding in the jungle. There'd be shots being shot at you and you wouldn't know where it would come from. By December 1965, there's 189,000 American soldiers in Vietnam. By 1966, the number doubles. Throughout this war, there are very few conventional battles. There's a lot of ambushes. There's a lot of night skirmishes. There's a lot of booby traps. And this leads to casualty rates as high as 100 per week in 1967. By December 1967, nearly 500,000 American soldiers are in Vietnam. Now, this is interesting. In World War II, we had battles where thousands of Americans died. But in World War II, there wasn't that much opposition to the war. Americans supported the war very strongly. When you have a lower number of people dying in a war, it's weird, but people get more upset. Because when you read about a newspaper, a thousand people die, that's a number. But it's hard to imagine a thousand people. It's a lot. It's a big number. It's hard to wrap your mind around. But 100 is much more easier for people to comprehend. And if 15 guys die in Vietnam on a Thursday, 1967, they can put that on the news. And they can, if it's only 15, they can show a picture and a name of everyone that dies. And when you watch it on television, you're not reading a number, a thousand people die. You see Johnny Jones. He was from Texas. He was 19 years old, shot dead in Vietnam, okay? You know, Martin, Martin Stevens from Kentucky, he was 20, you know, and you see those people named, he had a dog, you know, he was engaged to this woman, now he's dead. And that makes the war very personal, okay, because it's actually smaller casualties, people noticed the number of people that died, and they noticed, and they saw their names, and they saw their faces, and on the news, every night, there's reporting coverage of this, of this war. And people hear, oh, 37 people died in Vietnam today. Here's a picture of the body bags. You know, this was going through the news on a nightly basis, and people were starting to get wore out. But at the beginning of the war, Americans thought we were winning. The government was saying we were winning. The People, people were confident. The military said, we've got this in the bag. We are getting rid of the Viet Cong. And we were. We were winning. We were killing a lot of Viet Cong and a lot of Viet Minh. We were bombing the snot out of North Vietnam. They were hurting. And people thought that the war was almost over. But in January 1968, something happened called the Tet Offensive. And this really hurts Lyndon Johnson's presidency because he gets the blame for this. Tet is a holiday for Buddhists, and there's a lot of Buddhists in Vietnam. Typically, on the day of Tet, the fighting kind of took a break. It's kind of like, you don't want to go shoot people on Christmas. You know, it's like their Christmas. Okay. Think, think about it like that. Okay. It's, it's a holiday, roughly the same meaning to them. Okay. And so 80,000 Viet Cong 
launch a surprise attack on Tet. It catches the U.S. off guard, and it's at nearly every major American position in South Vietnam, even in places that we thought were completely safe. If you wanted to pick a safe spot in Vietnam, you would think the capital of South Vietnam would be the safest spot because that's where all the military is, that's where the U.S. Embassy is, that's safe. Well, guess what? Right here, it's American soldiers defending the embassy in Saigon. The U.S. military bases like Da Nang, very strongly held positions in Vietnam were under attack. And this throws the U.S. off guard. But we win the battle. We get knocked back on our heels, but we very quickly recover. And by the end of the Tet Offensive, we recapture all the lost territory and we inflict major casualties on the Viet Cong. For, you know, we inflict like two to one ratio of casualties on the Viet Cong. And so, from a military perspective, the Tet Offensive was a slam dunk victory for the United States. But from a political perspective, it was a loss. Why? Because the American public didn't see it as a victory. For the people watching on the news, they heard the news, an attack happened, and it was really bad. And they didn't pay attention to the part later on, a few weeks later, when we say, hey, we won the battle, because what they were worried about was that first, we got attacked. And it convinced many Americans that the government was lying about the war. They realized that the American government was lying about the war being easily won. And by April 1968, 42% of the American people were dubs who opposed the war. And only 41% were hawks who supported the war. This grew from 28%. So before the Tet Offensive, most Americans supported the war. After the Tet Offensive, more Americans opposed the war. The war was nowhere near being won. Public support was declining, and this affected U.S. soldiers' morale. Many American soldiers fighting the Vietnam War started to question the war. There was reports of increased indulgence in alcohol and drugs, and incidents of fragging or killing officers in combat and friendly fire increased. Soldiers who came back from the war returned home to a hostile public as people who opposed the war opposed the soldiers who were fighting the war. And this is wrong. The soldiers had nothing to do with causing the war. Many of these American soldiers are drafted. They don't have a choice to fight in the war. They're forced to fight, but they get the blame. General Westmoreland asked for 200,000 more troops, but Johnson refuses as the public opposed it. And this is a problem. You can't win a war and also win politics at the same time in this instance. The thing that the United States needed was more soldiers, but Lyndon Johnson is worried about getting reelected. He doesn't want to lose the election, so he doesn't give his soldiers what they need, and so we lose the war. And before it's over, he doesn't get to be president anymore anyways. So North Vietnam learned something from this. They are paying attention, and they are watching American news, that sort of thing. They have access to that information. They see that the Americans' resolve to win the war is fading. So the North Vietnamese, they change their strategy. Rather than having one big battle like the Tet Offensive, which hurt them because they lost so many soldiers, they decide to make the war last as long as possible. Just drag it out and bleed the Americans dry until the American public opinion demands that they withdraw. You see, North Vietnam couldn't win on the battlefield, but they could win in America's living rooms. They couldn't win on the, the battle, but they could win on the TV. And so the longer the war lasts, the more Americans watch it on the news, they see how bad the war is, they start telling their members of Congress and their president to get us out of the war, and that's how Vietnam's gonna win, by winning the TV. Not the battle, but the television. For five more years, North Vietnam drags their feet in peace negotiations, as the US strength at the negotiating table fades with each passing day. We start to see the anti-war movement. Originally, the, peop the people supported the war as necessary to stop communist expansion across the world, but as the war continues, more Americans oppose it. The peace movement opposed the war on moral and economic grounds. Many people thought that Vietnam was just fighting their for their independence and that the war was killing too many innocent Vietnamese peasants. There was too many, you know, um, too much collateral damage. 
and many people thought the military spending in the war was too costly for the reward. Think of all the things we could have done with the billions in dollars that we spent in Vietnam. How many schools we could have built, how many hospitals we could have made, how many people's lives could have been improved if we had not wasted all that money and all those lives in Vietnam. That's the peace argument. Another controversial thing about the war is the draft. The average American soldier in Vietnam was 19 years old. Okay, that's just a couple years older than some of you young men watching this. Young soldiers could fight in the war, but they were not allowed to vote. And this led later on to the 26th Amendment to the Constitution, which lowered the voting age from 21 to 18. College students could actually get out of the draft because they were in college. This exception led to most soldiers, it seemed that soldiers tended to be poor and less educated. So this is a war fought by poor people. 80% of the ground troops in the Vietnam War were from, were from lower classes and minorities were disproportionately assigned to combat. So many people opposed the war because of the inequity in fighting the war. This is a war being fought in drafts, okay? You know, the people who were sending America to war, the senators and representatives in Congress, their kids were in college. Their kids got out of the Vietnam War, but they were sending other kids to war. And the TV coverage of the war caused many Americans to question the U.S. involvement in the war. It was in our living rooms. We were seeing dead bodies, we were seeing battle, and it was distasteful. And it continually pressured Americans to want to get out of the war. The anti-war movement saw increasingly radical peace demonstrations, ironically, peace demonstrations that turned violent, prompting entire crowds to riot. College campuses were especially prone to rioting. There's a lot of fighting within America. And while a majority of Americans supported the war morally, the vocal demonstrators captured the national attention. In 1968, Richard Nixon runs for president. He promises law and order and peace with honor in his 1968 presidential campaign, and he wins control of a bitterly divided nation. Okay, so let's see how that turned. Now, we'll look, we're going to switch back. So let's look at let's look at it from the political side. So. In that same election, 1968, Johnson, he has lost popularity due to the Tet Offensive, and Johnson faced opposition within his own political party. Robert F. Kennedy, John F. Kennedy's brother, ran against Johnson for the Democratic nomination for the president. So Johnson decides not to run again for president. He decides he's done. He's not going to run for president again. His vice president, Hubert Humphrey, runs and promises to continue the Vietnam War in the Great Society. But Robert F. Kennedy is making grounds in the Democratic Party, and he receives a lot of support from African Americans for his support of civil rights. But in 1968, some bad things happen. April 4th, 1968, Martin Luther King Jr., the leader of the civil rights movement, is assassinated, lead, leading to waves of rioting across America. There's a lot of riots in, the 19, in 1968. It's a very violent time in American history. The plan is to teach y'all more about the civil rights movement in the next video, but Martin Luther King's assassination really, really hampers the civil rights movement, and it slows it down considerably. In that same year, just a month later, just a couple months later, Robert F. Kennedy is assassinated too, after winning the California primary. So Robert F. Kennedy is on his way to be the next president of the United States, and he gets assassinated before he can win the Democratic nomination. So, two very powerful political figures in America killed, a war that is getting out of hand, people are all kinds of upset. While the Democratic Convention is nominating Hubert Humphrey to be the president, presidential candidate of the Democratic Party, there are riots and protests outside that convention. The police are using clubs and tear gas as a Hubert Humphrey accepts the Democratic nomination. And as you can probably tell, he does not win. Richard Nixon becomes president. Richard Nixon runs again, promising that he spoke for the silent majority of Americans who supported the U.S. effort in Vietnam and demand law and order. Meanwhile, there's an Alabama governor named George Wallace who runs a separate segregation campaign. Segregation now, segregation forever. His name is George Wallace. He divides the Democratic Party, and so the Southern Democrats vote for Wallace. The Northern Democrats vote for Hubert Humphrey, 
and Richard Nixon smashes them all, wins an electoral landslide of 301 to 191 with only 43.4% of the popular vote. So look at all that red. Richard Nixon becomes president and Richard Nixon has to do deal with Vietnam. So let's look at how Richard Nixon deals with Vietnam real quick. And then we'll talk about Richard Nixon and detente and we'll be finished. So Richard Nixon takes control, but the war still drags on for another four years. He becomes president in 1969 and begins work in ending the American involvement in Vietnam. But Nixon has a difficult job. He's got to get out of the war without totally losing. It's kind of interesting. Richard Nixon wanted to be president real bad in 1960. He lost to John F. Kennedy. Now he becomes president and he has to deal with the problem that started when John, really even started before John F. Kennedy, but he's dealing with a big problem in Vietnam. He's got to figure out how do we get out without losing? How do we lose without losing? His solution, Vietnamization. We're not going to immediately just pull out all at once. We're going to slowly but surely gradually turn over fighting responsibilities to South Vietnam while keeping up our financial support. The plan was for South Vietnam to grow strong enough to defend itself, and then we would leave. The anti-war movement is not satisfied with Nixon's plan. They wanted the United States out immediately. In 1970, though, we actually have to expand the war. In order to get out of the war, we have to get a little bit deeper in. So we invade Cambodia, a technically neutral country, to stop the Viet Cong bases in Cambodia and the Ho Chi Minh Trail. This is one of the frustrating things about Vietnam. We were fighting in Vietnam, we'd be chasing the Viet Cong around, and then they'd run off to Cambodia, and then we couldn't go get them. You know, they crossed this magic line of the border of Cambodia, and now we can't fight them. Richard Nixon says, let's just go. So in 1970, we invade Cambodia to try to knock out the Viet Cong there, and this leads to protests in America. Students at Kent State University riot and protest the Cambodian invasion. They start tearing down buildings and destroying property and burning stuff down. The National Guard is sent to Kent State to restore order, and before it's over, four American students are killed in what becomes known as the Kent State Massacre because of the riot and the conflict with the National Guard. So America is ripping itself apart in the late 60s. That optimism of the early 60s has kind of gone away. By 1970, the United States learns of an event that was kept secret since 1968. In 1968, a massacre happened called the My Lai Massacre. U.S. soldiers were ordered to destroy a village called My Lai, and they ended up killing hundreds of innocent civilians. The lieutenant who ordered the attack was William Colley Jr. And this just reinforces the peace movement's argument that the war is bad and that America is being a bad guy right here. In 1971, the New York Times publishes a series of documents called the Pentagon Papers. They were, these were secret government documents that had been leaked by a man named Daniel Ellsberg. And this detailed a series of of lies that the American government had said. Basically, the papers showed that the US government had been lying to the American people about the war, about how bad it was, about the extent that we were involved. And there were a lot of things that broke the trust of American people. And this goes back to that conspiracy thing. In the 1960s and 1970s, Americans lose their trust in the government. And this is why we see a lot of conspiracies. If they lied about the Vietnam War, what else did they lie about? Did Lee Harvey Oswald kill John F. Kennedy? If they lied about this, why didn't they? Why would they not lie about something else? And so America's trust in our government is hurt. In December 1972, Richard Nixon's had enough. He orders a massive bombing campaign. North Vietnamese have not, they've been dragging their feet at the negotiation tables. So in December 1972, we just plaster the place with bombs. North Vietnam finally agrees to peace talks. And so in 1973, in January, a ceasefire is achieved. American soldiers go home, and North Vietnam promises to let South Vietnam be independent. And for two years, South Vietnam goes it alone. They have to fight the Viet Cong rebels. You see, Vietnam, North Vietnam left South Vietnam alone, but the Viet Cong rebels within South Vietnam kept fighting. And for two years, South Vietnam fought alone. But in 1975, North Vietnam breaks its promises and they attack South Vietnam. 
On April 1975, Saigon falls to the communist forces. The United States lets it happen. The United States thinks, should we go back in? North Vietnam broke their promise. But at that point, it's over. We, you know, just, just leave it be. America is tired. We can't handle it. We're done. The U.S. is out of the war, but most of Southeast Asia falls to communism as Cam or much of Southeast Asia falls to communism as Cambodia and Laos also become communist countries. 55,000 Americans die fighting in Vietnam, and South Vietnam falls to communism. So in many ways, the Vietnam War feels like a lost cause. We didn't win. But you could argue that in some ways we were successful. Vietnam fell to communism, and a couple of countries fell to communism, but we did stop that spread. When we first got involved in the 50s, it seemed like the floodgates were open and communism was just going to go everywhere. But by the middle of the 1970s, there's some problems going on in the Soviet Union and other places that are slowing communism down. So perhaps we did slow the spread of communism down. Maybe you might leave a comment below and having a discussion this week and let me know, do you think it was worth it? Was it worth our time to get involved in Vietnam? Or was it just a mess? Should we have gone harder? Should we have done more to win? Or should we have gotten out sooner or gone at all? Just let me know what your thoughts are about the Vietnam War below. Now, let's look at what Richard Nixon does with the rest of his presidency. We're almost done. I know it's been a long one, but I'm trying to get two done at once, so we'll see what we can do. So, Richard Nixon was a foreign policy expert. He was able to get us out of the Vietnam War without it being a total disaster right off the bat. At least by the time 1975 rolled around, he wasn't president anymore, so, you know, he didn't, he had other things to worry about. He spotted a weakness in communism, though, the division between China and the Soviet Union. You see, a lot of people just assume that the Soviet Union and China were just best buddies because they were both communist, but they're totally different. Chinese communism and Russian communism are two different things, and they don't really like each other. So the U.S. exploited this division between the Soviet Union and China in what was called triangular diplomacy. Richard Nixon sends his Secretary of State Henry Kissinger, and himself, he goes and visits China in a historic first. In February 1972, Richard Nixon tours the Great Wall, and he's the first you know, sitting U.S. president to go and hang out in China. And this laid the groundwork for normal relations between the U.S. and China. This leads to trade deals, and it leads to a lot of growth for both economies as the United States and China start trading back and forth with each other. And all of a sudden, China's not really our enemy anymore, or at least they're not as bad of an enemy. You see, trade is good for world peace. If you're trading with someone, you are less likely to fight them. And so the United States and China start trading stuff back and forth. China's not going to want to go to war with us. If they go to war with us, they lose all this money that we're giving them. We don't want to go to war with China because if we go to war with them, we lose all the stuff we're buying from them. So there is a desire between the United States and China to have peace. And this freaks out Russia because they were counting on China to help them if things went bad with the United States. And so now Russia doesn't have the backing of China. So now Russia's got to play nice too. And so this triangular diplomacy of the United States, China, and Russia in a triangle allows for the United States to be better friends with not just China, but also with Russia. The Soviet Union starts playing nice, and Richard Nixon actually goes and visits Moscow, the capital of Russia, in May of 1972. And there's a new leader of the Soviet Union named Leonid Brezhnev, and he and Nixon together signed something called the SALT I Treaty, or the Strategic Arms Limitation Treaty, which actually reduces the buildup of nuclear weapons in both the United States and Russia. And so for the first time since the 1940s, it kind of looks like the Cold War is starting to thaw. In this period of time in the mid-70s where the Soviet Union and the United States start to be less angry at each other, not friends, but less angry, like we're not going to kill each other at any second, this is called detente or a relaxation. And with this, we come to the end of this lesson. The plan is for the next lesson to be about the civil rights movement. So 
you have any questions, please feel free to leave a comment. Please feel free to email me or call me. I'd be happy to answer any questions you have. And go ahead and leave a comment today and let me know, was it right for the United States to get involved in the Vietnam War? Did we do it right? Should we have done more? Should we have done less? Let me know. And thank you for paying attention. Thank you for your time today. And I hope you all have a good rest of your day and a good time.